2,500 years ago, the first Persian Empire had been established. It stretched from modern-day Greece to northwestern India, from Central Asia down to northeastern Africa. Its ceremonial capital was Persepolis. After the empire was established, delegates from every region of this new empire brought tributes to the capital. Their gifts included an exotic array of produce, product, flora, and fauna. Artisans were contracted to depict the procession on the facade of the Apadana, an audience hall in the capital. And of those depicted, one group are the Ethiopian delegates. Men carrying treasures and riding horses are shown, and in the midst of the scene is a group of three boys, leading a strange-looking animal to give as a gift to the empire. To those who saw the facade over the millennia, it was likely just seen as a strange, exotic animal that they knew nothing about. But as we came into the age of science, the identity of this animal became a bit of a mystery. In many ways, it appeared to be similar to a well-known African animal, the giraffe. It seemed to have a longer than normal neck, and two conspicuous short horns on top of its head. But there were a few problems. For one, it wasn't nearly tall enough. It's clear that this animal was much smaller than a giraffe, as the people shown to be leading it were depicted as boys, as evidenced by their lack of beards. The neck was also too short, and of course, it had no spots. But this animal was known to a group of people in Central Africa. However, it wouldn't be for another two and a half thousand years until the rest of the world would come to know of its existence. Welcome back to All About Nature. On my channel, I try to bring nature-related content that's both educational and entertaining. If you like this kind of content, consider liking the video, leaving a comment, and subscribing to the channel. I'd like to take a moment to thank my patrons, including my newest patrons, Ria and Rodrigo. Thank you all for supporting the channel. And if you want to become a patron to get early access to videos and have a say in what I make next, consider supporting me on Patreon. The link is in the video description below. In Europe, fascination with the mythical was ever-present. Stories of dragons and ogres, sea monsters and unicorns. In Europe during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, mysterious long horns began to show up in markets. These spiraled horns didn't belong to any known animal to the people of Europe, so they attributed the horns to an animal that they had heard of but had never seen the unicorn. Unicorns were present in various ancient texts. The Greeks believed in unicorns, and so did the Persians. Unicorns are even mentioned in the Bible. An animal called Ra'em is mentioned nine times in the Bible, and was believed to be a large horned animal. When the King James Version of the Bible was published in 1611, Ra'em was translated as unicorn in English and public fascination with the animal was solidified. Of course, these horns, while real, were not from a unicorn at all. They were in fact tusks from an animal that was only found in one small spot of the Old World, in north-central Russia. Narwhals inhabit these cold waters, and many a hunter got rich by exploiting the European fascination with unicorn horns. By the late 18th century, Europeans had moved away from the fanatical and into the realms of science. They were in the depths of a taxonomy obsession, and were traveling the world classifying as many biological species as they could. When they weren't out collecting specimens, they were writing about their travels, and an interest among the European public 
with the mysteries of far-off places began. The first encounter Europeans had with the African unicorn came in 1804. John Barrow published a book on his travels in South Africa between 1797 and 1798. In his book, he told of the local bushmen who had assured him that single horned animals did indeed exist in the area. While they themselves hadn't seen them, they had seen drawings in caves of these one horned animals. He visited some caves with the Bushmen along the Zuraberg mountain range, but every cave that they went to, the animals depicted were familiar and not the one-horned unicorns being sought. Barrow was on a specific mission to find a unicorn, so he asked them to try again. A week later, they embarked on a long expedition to the Tarka Mountains. Our object was to find among the drawings the representation of an unicorn. One of our party promised to bring us directly to the spot where he knew such a drawing stood. We still continued our search in the kloofs of the mountains in the hope of meeting with the figure of the unicorn, the peasantry being equally sanguine to convince me of the truth of their assertions as I was to gratify curiosity. We came at length to a very high and concealed kloof, at the head of which was a deep cave covered in front by thick shrubbery. One of the party mounted up the steep ascent, and having made his way through the close brushwood, he gave us notice that the sides of the cavern were covered with drawings. After clearing the shrubs to let in the light, Barrow claims that he saw this drawing. Only the head was visible, as in front of it was a large drawing of an elephant. He claimed that this was the evidence that the unicorn was real. In his book, he goes on to claim that he offered large sums of money to the Bushmen to find the animal. But the story stops there. Naturally, many were skeptical of his claims. The main issue was that his drawing seemed far more like a European depiction of a unicorn than that of an African cave drawing. The other issue was that this cave was never found again. There's no evidence that it existed at all. Animals that seem to have a single horn aren't uncommon in ancient cave art, but this is really a matter of style. Cave art was interested in capturing the essence of the shape of an animal, not in creating a detailed 3D rendering. Many two-horned animals were depicted with a single horn. So even if Barrow had in fact seen a drawing with one horn, it wouldn't necessarily stand to reason that the animal depicted had only one horn in real life. But what's more interesting about Barrow's account of unicorns are the three stories he claims to have heard from other contemporary European explorers in Africa. Adrian van Jaafveld of Camdebu in Graf Reynet shot an animal a few years ago at the point of the Bambosberg that was entirely unknown to any of the colonists. The description he gave me of it in writing, taken as he said from a memorandum made at the time, was as follows. The figure came nearest to that of the quagga, but of a much larger size, being five feet high and eight feet long, the ground color yellowish with black stripes. Of these, were four curved ones on each side of the head, eleven of the same kind between the neck and shoulder, and three broad-waved lines running longitudinally from the shoulder to the thigh, mane short and erect, ears six inches long and striped across, tail like the quagga. On the center of the forehead was an excrescence of a hard bony substance covered with hair and resembling the rudiments of a horn. The length of this with the hair was 10 inches. About the same time, Jart van der Volt of Oliphant's River in Swellendam, in company with his brother, saw near the same place an animal exactly of the shape of a horse and somewhat larger than the quagga that had longitudinal black stripes on a light ground. It was grazing among a herd of elands. 
The two brothers, having been some time without food, from their anxiety first to secure an eland, neglected the striped animal, intending afterwards to give chase to it. But his speed was so wonderfully swift that bounding towards the mountains, he was presently out of their sight. Martinus Prinslow of Brointje's Hugte, when on a hunting excursion, saw behind the same mountain several wild horses entirely different from either the quagga or the zebra, but they were so shy that they never would approach them sufficiently near to make minute distinctions. They appeared to be of a light cinereous color, without stripes. The black and buff zebra, even when very near it, and especially if in motion, appears of a dull, bluish ash color, like the common ass. It is therefore probable that the animals described by the three different persons were of the same species. Vilant also, who may generally be depended on when he speaks of animals, mentions his having chased beyond the Namaquas day after day in vain an Isabella-colored zebra. This also, in all probability, was of the same kind as the others. The identity of these animals is still not known today. Was it just a quagga, or perhaps a Niala antelope, which at the time had still not yet been scientifically documented? If so, why do the accounts speak of black stripes and a single horn on the forehead? The identity of the animals in these accounts remains a mystery. The next accounts of Europeans seeing African unicorns are from nearly a century later, in 1890. Sir Henry M. Stanley was an author, soldier, journalist, politician, and colonial administrator in a region of Central Africa that at the time was referred to as the Congo Free State. Stanley was famous back in the UK as an explorer, having traveled along much of the Nile and Congo rivers. He wrote of his journeys in a series of books he published. One was titled, In Darkest Africa, and came in two volumes. In the second volume, Stanley tells the story of a visit with a pygmy people group known as the Wambuti, and of an animal that they claim to encounter on occasion in the jungle. The Wambuti knew a donkey and called it Ati. They say that they sometimes catch them in pits. What they can find to eat is a wonder. They eat leaves. The animal the Wambuti were referring to was a mystery to science, and so it intrigued readers all the more. Stanley was friends with an English artist, linguist, and fellow colonial administrator named Sir Harry Johnston. The pair discussed the possible identity of this Ati animal and became particularly interested in it. Meanwhile, other reports of the African unicorn were surfacing. The Belgians were also highly active in Central Africa at the time, and in 1897, reports of an interesting animal came to them from the Mumvas tribe of northeastern Congo. They called the animal Ndumbe, and said it looked similar to the Europeans' donkeys that they used to carry their supplies, but that it was taller than a buffalo, maroon brown across the body, having black and white stripes across the rump and legs and being graceful like a zebra in form and finish. Throughout the 1800s, the press in Europe reported on new animals, often referring to them as unicorns. Much of the time, the animal that was described was a rhinoceros, but the public thrived on stories of mysterious animals being found in far-off places, and as a result, newspapers used the term unicorn to attract readers. The idea that there was a real unicorn living in the depths of Africa was sensationalized. This sensation was compounded when the first physical evidence of the animal came to light. In 1899, Sir Harry Johnston was still a colonial administrator and had recently received control of northeastern Rhodesia which today is part of Zambia. The land shared a border with German East Africa, 
and it was around this time that British troops intercepted some Germans who had kidnapped a group of Pygmy people of the Mbuti tribe. The Mbuti inhabited the Congo region, and the Germans were planning to send them to Europe to put them on public display as human curiosities in Paris. The British were opposed to this, and Johnston became tasked with getting this group of people back to their home in the northeastern part of the Congo. But of course, Johnston still had the stories of the Ati on his mind, and he couldn't resist speaking with the tribespeople about the animal to see if they knew anything. All he knew was that the animal was like a donkey, eight leaves, and might have some stripes like a zebra. With the help of a translator, he described the unicorn to the Mbuti people. And he was amazed when they said that they knew exactly what animal he was talking about. Their name for it was the Okwapi. And they confirmed that it was similar to a donkey and that it had some stripes. It's unclear if by this point Johnston still believed that the animal he was searching for was the unicorn of myth and legend. But nevertheless, he was excited by the prospect of discovering the animal that had plagued his imagination for the past decade. Upon arriving in the Congo, the pygmy people he was escorting managed to find some tracks of the animal that they had described to Johnston. But Johnston was left bewildered. He assumed that the animal was some sort of horse, so he expected to see single-toed hoof tracks. Instead, the tracks that the Mbuti were pointing out were two-toed, meaning that the animal was more similar to a deer or an antelope. So he dismissed the claims of the Mbuti tribespeople, believing that they must be mistaken. Shortly after, Johnston came to Fort Mbeni, a Belgian outpost in the Semuliki forest in what is today Western Uganda. He spoke with Lieutenant Mera about the animal that he was looking for, and Mera didn't hesitate to confirm that the unicorn did indeed live in the region. In fact, he himself had seen bodies of the Okwapi many times and was relatively familiar with the animal. While they didn't currently have a specimen of the animal on site, they did have a skin of one that had recently been poached. Today, it's considered strange that Mera was so forthcoming with this information. European countries were in a highly competitive race to colonize Africa at the time, and part of that competition was taking credit for naming new species. Mera likely broke Belgian rules by sharing information with Johnston, and he probably got in a lot of trouble for it later. Now that Johnston knew about the skin, he desperately needed to see it for himself. Members of a local militia had taken the skin and cut it into three-foot-long strips to use as belts or bandoliers, and Johnston was able to get his hands on two of them. He chose two heavily striped strips of the skin and sent them off to Philip Sclater of the Zoological Society of London in November of 1900. Sclater then exhibited them at a meeting of the Zoological Society in December. And in 1901, he published his report. I have now had time to examine more carefully the two waist belts made of skin, forwarded to me by Sir Harry Johnston and already exhibited at the meeting on December 18th last. I have come to the conclusion that whether the native account of the animal from which they were taken is precisely correct or not, the specimens themselves cannot be referred to any of the known species of zebra and must belong to an undescribed animal, which I propose, provisionally at least, to name after its discoverer with the following characters until better specimens are obtained. As you can see from the report, the Okwapi was still believed to be a species of horse, though they couldn't be certain based on the skin alone. They needed to find the animal, so Johnston set out to do just that. Lieutenant Mera supplied Johnston with local guides, and Johnston set out into the Congolese jungle in search of the African unicorn. Again, the guides found tracks for the animal that they called the Okwapi, but again, the tracks were of a two-toed ungulate. 
Johnston refused to follow the tracks, certain that they would simply lead the group to some sort of forest antelope. The entire expedition ended up being a disaster. Many members of the search party came down with malaria and needed to be rescued by the Belgians at Fort Mbeni. Johnston also complained non-stop about the oppressive heat and humidity of the dense jungle. Eventually, they all gave up and returned empty-handed. Thankfully, it didn't take long for better evidence of the Okwapi to reach Johnston. This time, it came from the Swedish lieutenant that had replaced Lieutenant Mera, as he had recently died of Blackwater fever. The new lieutenant's name was Carl Eriksson, and he had come across the skull of an adult and a juvenile, as well as a complete skin. He sent them on to Johnston, again breaking all the rules for discovering a new species among the European colonies. Johnston finally had the detailed evidence that he had been looking for. Being a skilled artist, he drew what he believed the Aquapi to look like, based on the skin and the skulls and his drawings were surprisingly accurate. While the legs are too thin and their snouts are too pointy, for the most part, this was the first accurate scientific image produced of the African unicorn. And of course, it wasn't a unicorn at all. Johnston could tell when he looked at the skull that the elusive African unicorn wasn't a horse, but in fact a species of giraffid especially owing to the teeth. The feet hadn't been included with the skin that was sent, but it was safe to assume that he was wrong, and the Aquapi did in fact have two toed hooves, like giraffes do. Perhaps disappointingly, Johnston finally had the evidence that the animal didn't have a long, singular horn pointing straight out of the forehead, but two smaller, backward-pointing horns, again similar to giraffes. The skin and skulls were sent on to London, and by July of 1901, the Okapi had been officially scientifically described. There was much debate over the century of how to classify the species, but in the 1980s it was settled as a sister genus to giraffes. Despite the major differences in neck length, both giraffes and Okapis have only seven vertebrae in their necks, just like every other mammal species except for manatees and sloths. Throughout the 20th century, museums across the world wanted to get their hands on an okapi specimen for their collections. These elusive animals were chased into pits where they were speared to death from above. Many specimens in museums today show clear scarring across their bodies from the brutal way that they were collected. They used to range across much of what is the Democratic Republic of Congo today, and into a small part of northeastern Uganda. But by the 1970s, the last of the Ugandan okapis were wiped out. Zoos across the world have also housed okapis. The first was the Antwerp Zoo in Belgium. They obtained a live okapi in 1919, and they have since been one of the most successful zoos in breeding the species. Currently, okapis are housed in zoos across the United States, Europe, and Japan. In the wild, the population has declined significantly, and they're currently listed as endangered. Their population is extremely difficult to estimate, as they're solitary and wander across huge spanses of jungle. But it's believed that between 10,000 and 35,000 roam free in Central Africa today. The species faces a lot of threats. For one, they're still hunted for bushmeat on a regular basis throughout the region. They're also facing habitat loss due to logging and human encroachment. But perhaps the worst threat in modern times for the species is warfare. Illegal armed groups are common in the region, and in order to carry out their illegal activities, they need local authorities to stay away. In 2012, one of these groups went to extreme lengths to be able to get away with their crimes. In the Ituri Forest is the Okapi Wildlife Reserve. 
It covers 14,000 square kilometers of pristine jungle and is home to a myriad of rare wildlife, including elephants, leopards, and chimpanzees. It's also home to as much as a third of the wild Okapi population. And in 2012, on site at their research center were 14 Okapis that were being rehabilitated. The armed group in the area is known as the Mai Mai Rebels. They fund their operations by poaching elephants in the park and participating in illegal mining activities. On the 24th of June, 2012, they attacked the research center, killing six people they also killed two park rangers. And just to fully commit to their evil act, they killed all 14 of the Okapis that were being rehabilitated. Thankfully, conservation efforts are still strong in the region, and captive breeding has proven to be very successful. While the Okapis still face regular hardships, there are countless people and organizations around the world committed to maintaining this amazing species that only a century ago was considered a mythical unicorn by some. The mystery of the carving at Apadana has seemingly been solved. While the animal depicted does not have any stripes, no other known animal looks quite as much like this depiction as the Okapi does. For me, the discovery of the African unicorn is an exciting story. It reminds us of a time when most people knew little about the world beyond their own town. When imagination meant the thrill of discovering what was around the next corner. I remember looking at the horizon as a child, realizing that I didn't know what was beyond it, and desperately wanting to. I also knew that even if I got there, a new horizon would be waiting to be discovered. The allure of mystery over the horizon has guided many through uncharted territories, sparking curiosity and igniting the flames of excitement. Yet, as we unveiled the secrets of this once elusive species, we must acknowledge the bittersweet truth that accompanies revelation. The thrill of the unknown, the sense of wonder that permeated our quest, now stands at the precipice of transformation because it's in the act of discovery that we exchange the shroud of mystery for the clarity of understanding. It's a paradox of human nature. The pursuit of the unknown fuels our sense of adventure, yet the very act of unraveling the mysterious diminishes the magic that once enveloped it. As the veil is lifted, the once mystical African unicorn becomes a subject of study, and for the seeker, the world loses a fragment of its enchantment. Nevertheless, we shouldn't mourn the fading mystery, but rather celebrate the triumph of human curiosity. This quest not only unraveled the secrets of a hidden realm, but also kindled the flame of inquiry that defines our species. As we bid farewell to the enigma that captured our imagination, we also carry forward the spirit of exploration. For in the vast tapestry of the unknown, new horizons await, eager to be discovered by those daring enough to seek them out. And so, with a sense of nostalgia for the mystery that was, and anticipation for the mysteries yet to be uncovered, this concludes the story of the African unicorn, knowing that the heart of discovery beats within us, propelling us toward the next horizon of the unknown. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.